Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Brian Boland? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoyed this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case, move to the timeline of the incident, then offer my analysis. Brian Bowen was born in 1949 and grew up in Huntington, New York. This is on Long Island. His father, Frank, was a fireboat engineer in New York City, and his mother, Margaret, was a homemaker. Brian graduated from high school in 1967. He then went to the Pratt Institute in Brooklyn and earned his bachelor's degree in art and art education. He returned to that school and pursued his master's degree. After being inspired by a Sports Illustrated article about hot air balloons, he built a hot air balloon in 1971 as part of his master's thesis. After graduating, Brian moved to Connecticut to work at a high school teaching art photography. He enjoyed his job, but there was something about his balloon experience that left his head in the clouds. Leaving high school behind, he pursued a career in the world of hot air balloons. Brian designed and constructed hundreds of balloons and secured a commercial pilot certificate with a rating for lighter-than-air balloon. He also earned private privileges for airplane single-engine land. This rating is for a single-engine fixed-wing aircraft that only lands on land, so it excludes a seaplane. This is the most common license for private pilots. In addition to pilot ratings, Brian earned a repairman certificate for hot air balloon and airship. In 1988, Brian bought a 52-acre property in Vermont called the Post Mills Airport. The airport had two long grass runways. He moved from Connecticut to a house on the airport property. There were other structures on the property as well, including a workshop, several barns, and picnic tables. Many hot air balloon activities took place at the site, and Brian built several curious attractions for example, he constructed a few dinosaurs out of scrap wood, including a 122-foot sculpture he referred to as the Vermontosaurus. Brian offered rides to the public and trained people how to pilot balloons. During these hot air balloon adventures, Brian would spot old vehicles and other items sitting on various properties. He collected these items, often for free, and combined them with other junk in a makeshift museum on his property. He called it the Museum of Rusty, Dusty Stuff. In the local community, Brian was known as the Balloon Man. He spent years dazzling crowds, inspiring future balloon pilots, and running his airport. In 2020, Brian had a few severe medical problems that required surgeries and was unable to pilot a balloon. He was tired of being under the weather and anxious to get back in the air. In the spring of 2021, Brian was cleared to fly. Now moving to the timeline of the incident. On July 15, 2021, Brian Bowen took four passengers up in a balloon from the Post Mills Airport. The passengers were 38-year-old Emily Blake, her parents, 73-year-old Roger Blake and 67-year-old Ellen Blake, and Emily's 10-year-old daughter. The point of the balloon ride was to celebrate Emily's birthday. Roger and Ellen had been in a balloon before, but not with Brian as the pilot. Emily and her daughter had never been in a balloon. One thing was for certain, their first ride would be memorable. By this point, Brian was one of the most experienced balloon pilots in the world. The balloon that Brian used on this day was one of his larger balloons that he called Middle Fred. It had blue, yellow, and orange stripes. Brian had registered this balloon as being manufactured in 1984 by a company called Cameron. To say that Brian's balloon was heavily modified is a bit of an understatement. Brian had changed all the original components. Cameron had not manufactured any of the components that were currently on the balloon. The balloon technically should have been classified as experimental, which meant that it could not carry commercial passengers. Brian and the four passengers lifted off at about 6.30 p.m. The skies were clear it was 73 degrees, the visibility was 10 miles, and the wind was blowing at about 4.5 miles per hour. 
These are ideal conditions for flying a balloon. The balloon flew northeast along the Connecticut River toward the town of Bradford, Vermont. The fuel for the balloon burner was propane. Brian had multiple propane tanks on board. About 45 minutes into the flight, Brian removed the fuel line from an empty propane tank and attached it to one that was full. This was not an uncommon procedure. It was necessary for continued flight. As Brian moved the fuel line, he noticed that the pilot light on the burner had extinguished. This prompted him to say, that's not good. Brian searched for the igniter, but could not find it. He put his hands in his back pockets, patted his front pockets, and anxiously searched in other places. His behavior was not particularly reassuring to the passengers. Emily asked Brian if she could help him locate the igniter, but he did not respond. Instead, Brian kept searching, frantically. During this time, the balloon was descending because the burner was not functional. Brian had no way to heat the air in the balloon. In one of the supply pockets in the basket, Brian finally located a backup igniter. He ripped open the plastic bag, removed the igniter, and reignited the pilot light. He immediately activated the burner and generated as much heat as possible. Unfortunately, Brian had wasted too much time. The balloon was about 60 feet from the ground and still descending rapidly. Brian told the passengers to bend their knees and assured them that the balloon would bounce back into the air after striking the ground. When the balloon slammed into a sloping field near Fairley, Vermont, the basket tipped, which caused Brian and Ellen to be ejected. Ellen landed in the field. Brian was not as fortunate. His foot became trapped between the frame of the basket and the balloon attach rope. Through Ellen being ejected, the balloon was down one passenger. It lifted into the air with Brian still attached. He had one hand on a handle that was used to carry the basket. His other hand and his other foot were dangling. This was an extremely undesirable position for Brian to be in. Most balloon pilots agree that being in the basket is the optimal position for the continued safe operation of the aircraft. Brian had gone from being the pilot to being ballast. The remaining passengers were undoubtedly displeased with the sudden crew change. Emily looked over the side of the basket and saw Brian's shoe, but did not immediately realize that Brian was still wearing the shoe. This only came to her attention when she heard Brian yelling. He told them to stay in the basket, which was good advice. Emily yelled to Brian that they needed to get him in the basket. Brian replied, just leave me here, just leave me here. Emily repeated her statement, but Brian did not change his mind. He was able to get his foot free and grabbed the basket with his other hand, but he was not able to pull himself back into the basket. Brian started giving Emily and Roger instructions on how to land the balloon. Roger used the burner enough to clear obstacles on the ground, but was careful not to gain too much altitude because Brian was hanging from the balloon. The altitude of the balloon was about 500 feet at this point. A moment later, Brian stopped issuing instructions. Emily looked over the side and saw that Brian's face was very red. It was clear that he was not in good shape. Brian said to her, I can't hold on much longer. His assessment of the situation was accurate. At about 7.45 p.m., when the balloon was about 1.25 miles from where it had made contact with the ground, Brian said, I can't hang on anymore. He had been hanging on for about 10 minutes at this point. Emily heard him say the words, oh, blank, blank was a word that rhymes with wit, before she felt a change in the weight of the basket. Brian had let go. He crossed his arms over his chest as he looked up at the balloon. He fell into a field near the Connecticut River and was killed. Emily and Roger used a handheld radio to communicate with the chase vehicle driver. He gave them instructions on how to operate the balloon and prepare it for landing. After traveling another 3.45 miles, the balloon reached Piermont, New Hampshire, where it crashed into the upper parts of trees. As branches broke, the basket kept dropping. When it stopped just a few feet from the ground, Emily's daughter jumped out, moved behind a tree, and vomited. 
Emily and Roger also exited the basket. The three passengers ran across a field toward a road, wanting to get as far away as they could from the balloon. The chase vehicle driver met them on the road. An investigation into the incident determined that Brian Bowen was at fault. Even though his balloon was experimental, every component was functioning properly. Brian simply did not reignite the pilot light in time. Now moving to my analysis. Here are my thoughts on a few areas that stood out to me in this case. Item number one. When Brian Bowen was young, he was described as an introverted loner. He spent a lot of time making sketches of inventions and tinkering with mechanical items in the basement. As an adult, Brian became eccentric, sensation-seeking, and had an inflated ego. One could say that he was full of hot air. He married and divorced three times. He told people that he was a hard guy to live with, and if you want to stay married, don't become a balloonist. People described Brian as someone who did not like rules. There was no negotiating with him. He always thought he was right, and he could be extremely critical. He viewed himself as an accomplished artist who was destined to inspire other artists. He would become angry at people who he believed were not using their creative gifts. In 2010, Brian's only child, a son from his first marriage, died suddenly at the age of 25 from heart failure. Brian viewed this as a wake-up call and encouraged people to take chances. He said, quote, go for it, whatever it might be, a relationship or going somewhere or building something, unquote. Looking at Brian's personality on the five-factor model, he was very high in openness to experience. He was creative, had a lot of ideas, and embraced abstract thought. He had mid-range conscientiousness. Brian was low in extroversion, but he was high on the excitement-seeking facet. He was somewhat low in agreeableness and mid-range in neuroticism. Item number two. As I mentioned, Brian was blamed for the tragic incident that claimed his life. His failure to maintain quick access to backup igniters was out of character. Typically, he carried at least three igniters and periodically checked them to make sure they were functioning properly. He would even lecture other balloon pilots if they did not have a backup igniter in the back pocket of their pants. On the day he died, Brian delayed the flight several hours due to wind conditions, so safety was on his mind. Item number three, despite Brian's commitment to safety, there were some signs that he took unnecessary risks. For example, he was flying an experimental balloon in violation of the rules. Brian was extremely confident in his abilities as a balloon pilot. He suggested that he really didn't have to focus on flying the balloon because of his vast experience. This allowed him to function as a spectator and enjoy the view. He believed that he had the ability to fly automatically without consuming cognitive resources. Item number four, what do I think happened in this case? This is just a theory, my opinion. Brian's high openness to experience was consistent with being highly artistic, but his commitment to science was not as powerful. A good commercial balloon pilot adheres to standard procedures for safe flying, but Brian wanted to combine his love of art with the science of flight. For him, it was about aesthetics, the beauty and grandeur of soaring above the landscape. Brian was excited and amazed by artistic endeavors and the beauty of the natural world. Being in a hot air balloon gave him the view of the world that he needed as an artist. It was his inspiration. On the day of the fatal incident, Brian did not properly abide by a safety checklist. If he had, he would have known where the backup igniters were located. Failing to find the igniter in time caused the balloon to slam into the field. When Brian found himself hanging from the basket and being lifted back into the air, he knew his options were limited. The reason he did not attempt to get back in the basket was straightforward. Brian was physically unable. He had surgeries the year before, he was 72 years old, and he would not have been classified as having low body weight. Brian was not going to win a pull-up contest. His only hope was to direct the remaining passengers to land the balloon quickly. Brian Bowen died because he made a mistake that was completely avoidable. This error almost killed innocent people. He may have been a larger-than-life figure who was loved by many, 
but that does not alter the dangerousness of his behavior. Now moving to my final thoughts. For people who are highly artistic, following the rules is often not a priority. Hot air balloons, more so than other types of aircraft, tend to attract people who admire beauty. There's nothing wrong with soaring above the terrain and enjoying the view, but ignoring safety regulations should always go over like a lead balloon. Those are my thoughts in the case of Brian Bowen. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.